Anyway, what I'd like to do, I want to share a little bit about the Moore's Grace <coughs> Distributional Conversion. Now, Todd Ward, who is a good friend and colleague and, and actually helped lead the digital conversion at Moore's, will, I might get him to come up and lead a little bit. Of when he was visiting Moore's, I'd say, well, Todd, you get up and do this part, because he's done, he knows it. Uh, not get Patrick to come up and help lead this. But what I'd like to share a little about the digital conversion, but more importantly, the culture around using resources as an effic efficacy foundation for students. By the way, we've had to date 10,000, and these are documented visits, 10,000 visitors come to Mooresville. And you don't get to Mooresville by accident. You pretty much have to want to go to Mooresville. And people don't come from out of state on vacations there. But we've had 10,000 visitors from seven different countries, and they keep coming. There's a waiting list of over 500, and we, we had a visit last week and had a big group in. And the largest group came from Pennsylvania. We had a big group from New York. But I don't think we would have one single visitor if we had not tied our work to student achievement. So we tied that digital conversion. Michael Fullen and I are trying to finish up a book. In fact, I've got to get my game on this weekend and get a couple uh, pieces done on it, but we're working on a book called Unstoppable Momentum. We're, I'm actually doing a launch of it at the National School Board Association. Chapter two is called Digital Dabbling. And Michael said, this describes perfectly what's going on in most districts in the country. People that are buying technology and hardware and they're dabbling with using technology, but they don't have it ratcheted down into pedagogical framework. And that's what we're trying to say. You tie it to that. And I was uh, I was actually uh, speaking at a class at UNC Charlotte last night, and I was real disappointed to hear these were these were people working on their administrative degrees. So I was real disappointed. I asked them to describe what they were doing, and it sounded uh, several districts, but it sounded like a lot of digital dabbling. People are dabbling around the edges and aren't really focused. But a real key to our success at Morris was being culture. So I'm going to go ahead and jump in and share this with you. And, and I know, Jack, we're on a, uh, a framework I have time motivated because uh, my son does have a tennis match this afternoon. And Todd is playing tennis, so I want to get back and <laughs> see if it happens as well. So I'm be attentive to the time frame. But anyway, all these photos are from students. Well, uh, we've been in our digital conversion now. This is year nine. Uh, every, all K-12 students have their own device. Uh, four through 12 take them home 24 seven. They've taken them home now for seven years. Uh, 24 7 next year we're going to move down to third grade uh, and we've seen tremendous progress in terms of the use of digital resources and again tying it to achievement and and there are a lot of different uh, indicators of success certainly uh, academic performance but we also look at graduation rates we look at scholarships dropout rates uh, and we see a lot of areas where we're really proud of the achievement where we've been. I'm going to over out. And uh, one of the things that I hope I would encourage you to do that is to embrace your role as a learner. Now, I know that when you hear uh, Don Martin, and I really, really, Jack, I know we're so fortunate to have Dr. Martin uh, leverage the university here. Although I did, Luke was looking at the high point, I want a scholarship. <laughs> I'll tell you why. <laughs> I said, Luke, give me that pen a second. I said, 50 or 60,000. I mean, it's a, anyway, we're, we're the, public, the public payroll. We can't afford to, but anyway, I want to encourage you to embrace your role as the lead learner in your district. And I, I really truly believe this. I think great superintendents are great learners. They model learning for others. And, you know, some of the exciting, I, I, some of the exciting things we've done more is we will read books do Socratic seminars and have discussions. And I was talking to uh, one of our outstanding principals, and he said, you know, every time we do that, I'm going to be honest with you, he said, I, I dread it. I don't want to read it. But every time we do it, I know the value. And he said, I think of all the things I've read that I would have never read. So I really think uh, accepting and then modeling that role as a lead learner as, and being a leader of learners. And this is one of the things that I love Michael Fulham for this. In fact, we were, I was up in... Uh, Quebec City with him in Canada with, with the Canadian superintendents. And he really emphasizes this, that a prerequisite for being employed in district should be a complete commitment to continuous learning. And that means that you have to 
show evidence and really embrace the idea of what of, of learning. And if you can't describe what you're learning, you're probably not learning. So that's a little couple of things I think are really important and key, a real key to our success. Now, in terms of digital conversion, now this is this is one of the things I would share. Currently, 15% of the districts in the United States are register themselves as some kind of one-to-one, -one, either with a laptop or some device in some way. Now, it might be cards or whatever, but 80% of the other districts are aspirational. 80% of the districts say they're in their goals at some point. They would like to be a district where every student has a device. And the other 5%, I think, are trying to figure out how to use email because they can't respond to it. But, uh, but ultimately, there are a lot of reasons to move in this direction. And I, and I would really share this. Any district that doesn't move down this direction fairly rapidly, I don't think not only will you be left behind, you'll be left for, you'll be left for good. Because communities are going to thrive when students in the community are involved in uh, enterprises that are associated with students' future. And in Mooresville, it's interesting. Again, we're a small contained community, 6,000 students. We currently have 1,200 homes under construction. Now, I want to put this in context. You know, Iredell County includes Statesville, Mooresville, Troutman. Uh, in the last six months, 800 homes have sold in Iredell County. 800 homes have sold. Now, again, we're a small community. 720 in Mooresville, 80 in the rest of the county. So that what, that, what this, you know, people are, there's a sense of, uh, you know, a couple of things. One, uh, digital divide. Now, most students today have access to some type of phone or maybe some device at home, but for real work, for real implementation, for them to really delve deep, a lot of families still do not. When we started Digital Divide in Mooresville, we had a, we had a digital divide, an opportunity divide, a hope divide. Uh, and my first week on the job, the local NAACP came to visit me and said they were filing a class action lawsuit against the district because of two things. One, a significant level of, uh, of variation on suspension ratio. We were over suspending African American students and then huge gaps, achievement gaps, graduation gaps. And that's one of the things when we hired uh, Dr. Work to come in, he really hit that head on and said, we're going to become a, and this was a real part of the legacy that still lives on from his work at Morrisville High School, we're going to become a child-centered school. And it was a teacher center school. By the way, <clears throat> most most locations, and there's there are different surveys you can use for this, will determine you can use a there's one from ASC, there's also from one ASA are are you a child is this a child centered school or a teacher centered school? About eighty to ninety percent come up with teacher centered schools. Choices are driven by what's best for teachers. And lots of times what's best for teachers may not be what's best for students. Now balancing that as a new superintendent. Because the one thing I'll tell you, superintendents come in and say, we're going to change the world. They usually change it by coming and leaving pretty quickly. Because <laughs> I think you have to, you know, you have to build capacity. And one of the things that we did in Morris, we started out slow. We started out mainly with the English department in Morrisville High School to do a lot of troubleshooting. And then the next year we implemented it in two schools. So we did it even in that small setting on a gradual scale. We wanted to close the digital divide, bring relevance to instruction, get ready for 20, the 21st century. You know, we're well into it. <laughs> Uh, real world experience, the best instructional practice. Now, I, will, I really believe this. I think that if students don't have digital resources and teachers don't have it, they cannot be involved in the best instructional practice. It's impossible. You don't have the resources to connect people together. You don't have the resources to connect students to other places and other learning. And it's just like when you know, we had some visitors in recently, there were some textbooks over on the shelf, and somebody said, do you ever use those? And the students said, no. Why? Why? What would we use them for? <laughs> and they, they weren't being rude. They weren't being cool. They were saying, no, we, what, what would you use it for? They said, well, you know, for, to look at things. They said, well, no, you know, we, we, we wouldn't do that. We have not bought a textbook in eight years now. Not a single textbook. By the way, we rank 99th in funding out of 115 districts in the state. And I'll show a little correspondence because a lot of times with ID, you can't do it. Uh, Green County is a, 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 a district with lots of poverty challenges, and they jumped in on this years ago, say we're going to be committed to children. But again, real world experience, best instructional practice, and then improving academic achievement. By the way, and this is something I think is a problem. Michael Fullen, I, I started talking to Michael 
two or three years ago, but I've been a fan of his for years. Todd, you remember when we read Six Secrets? And to this day, that book is one of the great books. I still gravitate toward it as a, as a cultural model. But he told me, he said, I'm worried, Mark, because I used to be able to tick off six or eight places in the United States that I would say have aligned a digital implementation to pedagogical change to achievement. And he said, very few places I can mention that. Very few places because the evidence, you know, people come and go. Well, I think it is vitally important that we tie it to academic achievement. And ultimately, I think it comes down to a moral imperative. I really believe that if we're going to prepare children for their future and not our past, then we've got to get the game on and say, what, what will they need for their future? Uh, and now, by the way, I would say this. I think that you have to take baby steps. And I would say to go slow, to go fast. And the biggest mistakes that I've seen, and I've been involved with, again, districts all over the country, is when they try to run in and do something, and they don't take their time and do it well and then they get in trouble with it early on. I had, uh, I won't say the district, the assistant principal in this class last night who was just trashing her district. And I mean, was letting it go saying, we did the, we passed all these laptops, nobody knows what they're doing. It is just one big mess. And now I'm gonna let the superintendent know, I didn't tell her, I know, I'm gonna let the superintendent know, you got an agent out there doing a lot of damage for you. But if she described it, if that assistant principal it doesn't sound good. And so I think one of the things that you have to do is you have to build people along. One of the things we talked about in Morrisville early on is having one voice. Really keeping keeping things together so that when the public says, how are, you know, so we know what's going on and, and have a continuity of, around the discussion. Todd, why don't you get up and do this one? You help, you help one. Come on, I'm serious. Come on, Todd. You help, you help start this. This is Matt talking about building public support. You were there when we started. Go ahead. He didn't, he didn't know, but this, this is good for him. No, it's not for a while. I'm back in the sun. You know, it, it, Morrisville is a unique community. I, I, Dr. Edwards, unfortunately, hired me just about six months after he had been um, hired as superintendent. And um, he described it well that Morrisville was a place, in my opinion, that had become comfortable with average performance. And there was a population of the community that felt really good about schools and, a, and a, another population of the community that felt completely alienated by the system. So there was a lot of work that had to be done, not only to build trust between the community and, and the school district, but also to really send home this message of why this initiative was so important. Um, and, and there was a lot of things that we did. I can remember um, Dr. Edwards had a, we had a great night in the auditorium at the high school um, where we had Susan Patrick come in, who was national director of technology at the time. Um, we had David Warlick, if you know that name, he's not on the scene as much as he used to be, but um, we had four, five, 600 parents come that night and it was really just a night about trying to, to communicate this why of why this is so important. Um, the national landscape and why our kids in, in a small town in North Carolina, what we needed to do to make them nationally competitive. And uh, it, it was very well received that night. And it was, it was really just the beginning of that. And that was that community <coughs> symposium. Um, all of us as principals had a responsibility and Dr. Edwards gave us opportunities to, to speak to the community, whether it was the chamber, it was economic development groups, it was our own parent groups. But it was a lot of what we face even more right now in public ed, which is about um, how we make our schools the most attractive choice and, and how we sell the work that we're doing. Um, we had our own parent and teacher advisory groups. Um, I can tell you at the high school level, those were waning at the school that I had gone into. I had a, a high school of 1,600 kids and a booster club of five and a PTA that was non-existent. Parents had just become really disengaged and um, really just complacent in their involvement. Um, so we had that work to do. Um, we did get the opportunity as well to spend time with elected leaders. We were fortunate to have a, a board that was hugely supportive of Dr. Edwards' vision, um, which was incredibly helpful as, as we rolled this out. But as Dr. Edwards has shared, the, the political landscape in Iredale County is not one that's always public school friendly. So there was quite a bit of work to do there in, in the community as well. Um, so that, this, was, this was quite a learning experience from the principal end. Um, but it was, it's, 
it's trained me now well for the position I'm in because each of us in this room, I feel like, are, are having to sell the why of anything that we're trying to do uh, with our competitions with charter schools or just more attractive choices out there. Thanks, thanks, Dr. Ward. You know, I think the real thing is constant focus on communication and, and engaging with parents and engaging with elected leaders. And uh, I know, and I'm sure Jack remembers a few years ago, we were in a real contentious framework as we continue to be with some of the legislative initiatives, but there was a sense we need to meet with the people that are making decisions. And sometimes, you know, they may, they may be individuals that we're not particularly fond of, but I, I heard this say, and I think it's relevant, you know, if you're not at the, at the table, the dinner table for discussion, you may be on the menu. And it's really important to remember that we need to engage in constant discussion. And uh, Sam and I were talking about the county election coming up, and, and Sam did great work in Mooresville back many years ago. And uh, we were talking about it, still has a lot of friends and colleagues, and, and one of them has a real good friend who's running for county commissioner. So we were talking about it. You know, Sam gave me some information that was important. Sam said he would call and help, and things turned out in a positive way. But I think being attentive to the micro macro politics and superintendents that are oblivious to it, you you know, you might wake up one day and your board saying, "Hey, we need to have a meeting," and you say, "What's the meeting about?" I say, it's, "It's about you, Sam." Just one thing, <clears throat> and put some things in perspective perspective. I was there from 83 to 93. Todd just said that he had 1,600 kids in high school. I had 1,400 kids in the district in 83. I think it was around 3,000 when I left. Uh, we compared ourselves to the performances of Chapel Hill. Different measures back then, but you know, I had three physics classes, but they were outscored Chapel Hill's physics classes, nobody knew the difference, but they've got 50 physics right. classes. But that community watches very carefully what Mark does, because he also has their pocketbook. He gets to set the tax rate the first day of August each year for supplemental purposes. Still didn't have any money, but you can get a check written when you need it. And uh, there were four superintendents, three or four between me and Mark. And that's when they got complacent, because they were turning them over, one after the other. And um, well, I'm glad you're doing what you're doing, that the community deserves it. And I'll say one thing about Dr. Houston again. He, he, he set the bar high in Mooresville. He said, you're going to be a, a district that's taking a, taking a big look at things. <laughs> and move on to this next ingredients uh, here. Some third world countries are blazing heads. By the way, 
South Korea, every student has their own laptop. Uruguay, every student has their own laptop. Uh, France is trying to move in this direction. And it's, this is important. And even though China, it, percentage wise, it's a small number, if you take the number of students that are moving right in this direction, it's a huge number. But using those tools, having a data rich and intensive environment. You know, we have quarterly data meetings. We started this several years ago. And we have had districts, and we have districts who come in to visit. We have a summer conference that we put on, I invite you to come next summer. This summer is sold out. Uh, but we have people come in again from all over the place. They never leave talking about hardware. They always leave talking about culture. But one of the things that they're tremendously interested in is our data-rich environment. And our teachers, I asked one of our students who were in this class when I was teaching classes a favor to him. Uh, I said, how many teacher leaders do you think we have at Morrisville Middle School? I have a faculty of about 65. He said, I'd say 25 are outstanding leaders Another 10 are strong leaders, so well over half that faculty. We would describe without hesitation as strong teacher leaders. Now, the book that Jack uh, distributed, uh, Thank You for Your Leadership, is really about inculcating and building a culture of teacher leadership. And I love it because we have our data meetings now, the teachers, you know, we, I was describing this last night, and I could see the shock and fear in some faces because we put up performance of every teacher. We talk about it. We discuss it. We talk about outliers or the deficiencies. We have got really comfortable with it. Now, when we first did it, nobody was comfortable with it. We were uncomfortable with it. But getting comfortable with the uncomfortable is a key part of leveraging for that innovation of digital resources, capacity building. Now, one of the number one jobs, and I don't know if you, as, as you were moving in the direction, but building capacity of teachers and of leaders and of central office staff is a major part of the work that we do. And I, I'll tell you something that I was very fortunate. I was served as assistant superintendent in Wake County many, many years ago. In fact, Jim Merrill and I, and Bill McNeil, and their whole we were all assistant superintendents there at the same time. But Dr. Bob Lentz is now deceased. But he was a real nurturer. And he, he used to, you know, he called me a young pup and tells you how long it goes. He said, you know, you're you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna roll, you're gonna run, but you have to work on it. He was encouraging. So nurturing leadership in others, encouraging, and this is I think giving people tough feedback. I can promise you, you tonight after Todd has two or three drinks, ask Todd see if he's ever had any tough feedback. He's oh yeah, see it's I've had some tough feedback. I've had tough feedback. If you're not willing to give tough feedback, you shouldn't be in the chair that you're sitting in today. And that means giving tough feedback with care, but giving tough feedback and really understanding that building capacity means that for somebody to grow, you have to help lift them up. And I will tell you, I've taken that seriously my whole career, and I'm really proud that there are currently 19 superintendents, including Todd and Tony Jackson in North Carolina, who are superintendent, current superintendents in the United States, including Baltimore County and Philadelphia. Uh, in fact, when, when Todd was in a doctoral class, I was teaching a class and Skyped in leaders from all over the country, several that we used to work together. And, and I'm really proud of that. The new superintendent in Plano, Texas and I used to work together. The new superintendent in Volusia County, Florida. Superintendent in Ithaca, New York. We all work together. And and all of them, to some extent, would if you asked them, they'd say that I'm, I'm a mentor. We talk to each other. And but the thing is also creating this sense of, sense of all in. I love this. I was at Mooresville Middle School yesterday. I was walking down the hall with Dr. Gardner. Uh, one, our outstanding principal there who will be another great superintendent. In fact, I'd say there's at least half a dozen leaders in Mooresville right now who I can guarantee you will be superintendents, some sooner than later. But so when we were walking down the hall, new custodian, I told him I've never seen the floors look better. He said, wait till next fall. Mm -hmm. He goes, I'm new in here, but we're gonna make this thing shine like you've never seen it before. But, but he's got that, that, that custodian has got that all in. By the way, mm -hmm. 50% of your employees are not educators. They're the bus drivers and the custodians and they're the child nutrition staff and the secretaries. And, and if, if they're not shown respect and appreciation, don't expect them to step up and do great work. And that's one of the things that I really truly believe that you try to lift up everybody. Yesterday I walked into the, uh, I always when I visit a school, try to go back into the kitchen and say hello to the child nutrition staff and thank them. By the way, somebody, one of the things, I became a principal when I was 27. I didn't have a clue what I was doing. I called my mother, in Tennessee, outside of Nashville. And my mom said, what do you need? I said, she said you're, you're, you're supposed to, your work. And I said, I am. I said, but you know, I, I don't, you know, I don't really know what to 
do. I'm a prime minister, I'm principal of the school, but I'm kind of worried. And she said, we had that master's class. And I said, yeah, yeah, I had a master's course and had a master's degree. And she said, well, go around and go to every classroom and thank the teachers and kind of act like you know what you're doing. And just keep doing that. And you know what, I started doing that. And I'll tell you this date how old I am. I started doing that uh, early, early 1980s, saying thank you. And guess what I was doing yesterday at Horsell Middle School? Going to every single class, looking every teacher in the eye and saying thank you for what you do. I got a letter from a teacher from Henrico County, Virginia, a district of about 50,000 students, wraps around uh, Richmond. I was superintendent there for 10 years from 94 to 2004. I got a letter from a teacher and she said, Dr. Edwards, I'm retiring from uh, J.R. Tucker High School, why you remember this, remember when we did that, all that. And she said, I just want you to know that you were the first superintendent that ever came to my room and said thank you. You were the last superintendent that ever came to my room and thank you. And I thank you for thanking me. Please tell superintendents to thank teachers in their classrooms. And I really can't, I can't, I can't, uh, I can't overstate how important that engagement is. It's a real simple thing. It doesn't cost anything, but if the returns on it are huge. And you know, when you do that over time, it pays big dividends. And it also, I think, and by the way, let me tell you what I used to go in when Todd and I were walking around Morrisville High School and I'd say, thank you for your hard work or thank you for what you're doing. Now I'm a little more selective with a lot of the teachers and a lot of the staff, I say, thank you for your leadership. Try, try this, next time you're just out walking, say thank you to some people and then say thank you for your leadership and see what happens. I can tell you, you will see a visceral uh, physical reaction different than when you just say thank you. You say thank you for your leadership. That is a message that the individual that you're thanking that you have an expectation for them to lead. And I think it's, uh, Michael Fulton and I were talking about, I think it really uh, pay, pays big dividends. Now, so what are some of the implications of going into a digital uh, conversion? That's what we call our program. One, precision. This is why any district uh, that if you're not in this direction, you're gonna miss it in terms of teachers having precision for personalization, <coughs> precision for collaboration, and precision for information so that students are getting the adequate services that they need. So precision is something that's incredible. I was talking to Tom Greaves, who was the principal researcher for Project Red, did work in Mooresville. Uh, he's, um, they did Project uh, Red 1, 2, now they're on Project Red 3. Now he's working with the state of Utah, and they're, uh, they're buying, I'm real pleased with this, he said we're finalizing the deal for them to buy every, every teacher in the state of Utah, their first book, which is called Every Child Every Day, as a blueprint for a digital conversion. But one of the things that as a state, Utah has said, we're not gonna, we're not gonna let somebody out to beat us. So they're looking at a whole statewide industry so that every student in the state would be provided a device and some support, but competency is evolution. Now I really believe this, now you did not arrive in the chair that you're in today by accident. You demonstrated competency, you demonstrated skills, knowledge, understanding, uh, efficacy for students. But I really believe this, if you don't have on your, your grow boots, you won't be in that chair very long. And that means you constantly are saying, I wanna grow and learn. And I can honestly say this, 21, I actually started my 22nd year as a superintendent a couple months ago. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know how I survived my first 10 years or first 15. And in fact, I can also, the teachers at Morrisville and the staff and people like Todd and others have taught me more, Scott Smith, in the last four years that I don't want to survive. So one of the things that I think that having that constant, that you know, your personal efficacy as a learner, uh, but your competency and the competency of others. By the way, we had teachers that when we first started were the real high flyers. And if they didn't continue to grow, they're not even in the game anymore. We interviewed a teacher yesterday, middle school principal, some interviewed a teacher that was recommended from another district and with good recommendations said this, this teacher is just tremendous in using digital resources. And the principal said that this teacher was stuck from a learning position from about six or eight years ago and couldn't, you know, couldn't do the work in Morgan. But building that competency Creativity and relevance drive productivity. Uh, one of the things I love, we, we do senior projects that we do a thing called a Gateway Project at grades six, eight, and 12, where students do a semester long research project, just like a senior project, and they go before an adjudicated panel. Yesterday I saw some of the students, some of their pre 
research projects. I saw a student who was doing one on the, poli the European political influence pre-World War I that set the stage for the world. And it was this detailed, I guarantee you, you could get an A in any college course for this. But creating an environment where their students are, there's that sense of big learning, collaboration, uh, productivity, uh, creativity. And one of the things that we're just now, I think, just now getting into is really maximizing the use of digital resources and collaborative tools for students that are working together in collaborative teams or working with students from other states, from other countries. And by the way, we have second grade students that have had a three year relationship with students from China. There's a constant kind of a sense of new information, new learning coming in. It's motivational. And also, when we talk about personalization, now you think about this. If you want to personalize learning for students, how do you personalize it in an analog world? You don't. It's just the reason that when my son Luke takes a test now, if he has to wait to wait ten minutes, he's I can't, you know gets the I can't, what am I going to get some information back? Teachers and students need that information back immediately, and in a digital world, they can have it now. Now the number one question that we have all around the country is how can you how can we afford to do this? Now I was up, I was speaking up in, at the University of Rochester a couple weeks ago and to uh, it was a group consortium group of uh, districts from around Rochester, New York. And they they were real, how can we afford to do this? So I asked one of them, I said, well, how much what's your per pupil expenditure per people? He said, it's less than twenty two thousand dollars per pupil per year. I said, we can't twenty-two thousand dollars. We buy every student a go-kart, a pony, a laptop, and a trip to Disney World. So the bottom line is that you know, just like you're saying, how do you afford it? They can afford it, and we can afford it. And by the way, our our uh, just like you have all, we have seen our budget cut every single year, year after year after year, and we're down. Uh, four hundred dollars for people less than we were when we started the digital conversion. By the way, we have done four refreshes. And one cautionary I know I would say is that if you don't build this into your operating budget, if you build it on grants, you got to build it into a long-term plan. You got to do it. If you don't, and I can I can tell you, there's a district that I work with, and they're facing a, you know really a catastrophic issue because they rely solely on grant money. They have no place to go. So, but the way we break this down, and I really think parents like this and understand it, business leaders like it. When you say, how much does this cost? But you say, well, it costs, uh, you know, what does a laptop cost? Well, that's part of the cost. But this is the way we frame it. A dollar and a half per student per day. And what it comes down to is somewhere between $250, $275 per year. Now that includes the hardware, all the software, all the PD, everything but the infrastructure. The infrastructure like bathrooms and and parking lots you have to have them no matter what and and, and you know all these costs have come down but when you break it down like that say if you've got seven thousand dollars to spend and you're going to dedicate two hundred and seventy five dollars on a student makes a lot of sense now when i worked with harcourt we produced a u.s history textbook five pounds four inches thick i was really proud of it this big great big old u.s history i love u.s history I was visiting with Todd one time at Mooresville High School. I said, look, there's one of my books. Todd said, where, where? I said, right under that projector. It was just, it was perfect. It worked perfect. It was the right height. In fact, the teacher, Scott Rubin, said, I, I can't even, you know, they left these history books in my boss's classroom. It's perfect. But it's absolutely doable. And I would say that you, know, you have to, you've got to be creative. By the way, we have had, we've applied for grants. We just, you know, we don't have, we don't have grant writers. Uh, so we have, Built it into the operating budget. I think when you build it in, say this is how much money. And by the way, when we had back six or seven years ago, Jack, we had big budget cuts. We lost 10 percent. We had to cut 10 percent of our staff in Warsaw. And I remember, I remember this with principal. And I said, "All right, principal, I want you to give me the names of the people that you plan to cut." By the way, the principals didn't want to do it. He said, "I don't, I don't want to put those names." I said, "You got to put your names down because we're going to cut. And it's going to happen." And I said, "By the way, I'll meet with any." teacher that you know we have to do it we don't have a choice and I understand this this, this is one of the hardest things one of the hardest things I've ever done we had a, we had a budget form, vote form and 
were quite a few parents there, and I was very concerned. People would say, well, if they had one of those darn laptops, we'd be cutting people. <laughs> one guy stood up, and I thought, here it comes. He, got, he said, well, I want to say one thing. Whatever you do, don't turn back on this digital conversion. This is making a difference for all of our kids. There was a polite applause, no more questions about digital conversion. Now, our board chairman later on, or vice chairman later on, somebody got his face about that, and he said, oh, no, no, you got that, but why did you spend all that money on technology? He said, oh, no, you got it wrong. We, we spend it on children. And this is really when you're investing, when you're, when you're providing those resources for children, and you're making a difference in their life, you're spending money on children. You're not spending, you know, you can talk about it just like when you, so I think it's important to put it in associative terms. Let me pause right now and see if you have any questions up at this point. This is one of the areas that people there's huge interest in this. By the way, districts all over the country are figuring out. I've always thought, you know, we, we are one of the lowest funded, but if you want to go out to Utah, you find uh, 5,000 per pupil. If you want to go to Idaho, 5,000 per pupil. The districts there have figured it out. We have a district coming in next week from Utah, Wasatch, right outside of Salt Lake City. They're full on one-to-one. -one. They spend $5,000 per pupil per year. And they just, you know, they said, we're going to build this into our budget. We're going to make it work. Go ahead here. Now, uh, Todd, you were, were you still more when PBS came in? I was, yes, sir. Okay, well, you know, the PBS came in and wanted to do a documentary. Uh, John Talenko, who I got to know when I was up in Virginia, came in with Learning Matters and the Murrow Report. Uh, and they still, but you can go on the PBS website, you can see now we had the old MacBooks. Uh, we were still primarily straight rows, so you can see, you'll see kind of the evolution, but this kind of gives a, uh, a framework. But if you go, this is on the news hour, Jim Lair news hour, but you can still go to the PBS website and see this video, kind of get a context. And I would also say, I know some districts right now that are doing this, and they're using this in their public meetings, uh, and they're showing uh, kind of the gradation of moving forward and they're showing that this is a documentary uh, by the way then this the, the the guy that's doing this doesn't declare a success he goes well, we'll see this is early on they're trying to figure it out there's pluses and minuses they have parents who were positive parents who had concerns about it uh, but we started getting quite a bit of attention at the national level now about a year later we had a call from a guy from the New York Times, and he said, I'm an investigative reporter for the New York Times. I'd like to come down and do a, spend about a week with you and do an investigative report. And you talk about sending shutters. You get a New York Times, I'm going to do an investigative study. He came out and did spend a week. So I checked around, and he had written a couple of very unflattering articles. So I was concerned, but as it turns out, he wrote a very positive article. He spent a lot of time. Uh, with a lot of people from I me, mean, he walked up and down the streets and talked to everybody. I mean, he spent a lot of time. But this article was the most read, blog, and emailed article of the New York Times on Education for about a three year period. It blew up. Our students took over a blog, really took over an international blog, and were, you know, saying some good things and some things I wish they hadn't said, but saying a lot of good things. But then you can go to the New York Times website, you can see this. Uh, it was repurposed by CNN, then it was repurposed by the Wall Street Journal. And, it, and to tell you, it's still used as a reference point in terms of research, as a, a documentation in terms of, you can see we've gone to some uh, different laptops and that. And then, now, six months later, we get a call from Fox News, Juan Williams saying, we want to come down to an investigative telejournal report in Warsaw. So we said, well, come on, you know, we want to be fair and balanced. So if we have New York Times, we'll have, so Fox News came down, big production crew, same thing went through that. We can take credit for the only time that the New York Times and Fox News agreed is on Mooresville Grade School District. They basically did the same two stories, but you can go to the, uh, the Fox News website and see this documentary. And by the way, a lot of people, you know, we've had so much attention, people look at these and look at them again and kind of dissect them and offer opinions. And I actually, there's a Harvard professor who's doing an analysis of this piece the New York Times piece, the PBS piece, and the piece that was in eSchool News and talking about how little difference there is in all the media outlets about opinions. Uh, we have had a, to date, uh, 60 some odd journal articles about the Morris Great District and, uh, and, and leadership did one on us on our, in terms of our professional development, American School Board Journal on School Board Relations. Uh, district administration did one. They did. Uh, they did second one on our uh, leadership team. 
we received the Sylvia Charp Award in the Teaching Journal. My favorite all-time article, Best School District in America. Now, we've got, I've got quite a bit of flack from friends around this, but I, I, I keep this article at home and at school. Uh, but uh, this guy's done the, I didn't know, they asked me, said, the editor must be your brother. But this is a nice thing, by the way, 60% of all the world's cough drops are made in Morrisville. Place called, it used to be Best Sweets, now it's Best Cup. I didn't know this, I was out begging for money. By the way, good superintendents learn to beg for money. I, I'm, I'm kind of tired as I'm constantly out there. Because we have no money for PD, we have to beg money for PD. So we're constantly trying to bring resources. Now Sam, Sam, was, Sam was good, Sam was out there grabbing that money. And I think superintendents kind of sit back and say, well, uh, you know, things aren't happening. You have to go make it happen. You know, our foundation, I'll tell you, the year before I got there, I'll tell you how much money the foundation brought in. Not one single nickel. Now our foundation brings in right close to a quarter million dollars a year. We do two simple things. We, one is most of us through a golf tournament. But we said, to the station, we, it's all local, but we brought that, and we spent all that money directly on PD and scholarships. Uh, but this article, obviously, we got a whole lot of attention. We were very excited about it. And the CEO of BESCO was trying to hire uh, some new uh, engineers. They were chemical engineers to work at the BESCO company. He's South African. And he said he was getting a lot of pushback about coming to North Carolina. Because they said, we, you know, we're, we've got young children, and we're reading about North Carolina, and we're concerned about it. And uh, he had this article. He said, we'll take a look at this one. I said, what is this? And he said, it's our local school district. And he told me later on, and by the way, he made a big contribution to help support, but he said, they all said, sign us up. We're ready to come. And I think those things, they tie into economic development. Mm -hmm. the, greatest, the, the greatest leverage for economic development in the state is public education. And why we have elected leaders that cannot understand that there's a direct correlation between strong public education and economic development. But this was one that we were certainly pleased with. Uh, a couple years later, 2013, this was published uh, from a Taiwan uh, children's magazine. I was on an airplane with a lady. She had this magazine, and she opened it up, and she said, is this you? And I said, well, yeah, what is that? She goes, it's a Taiwan magazine, and it was upside down and backwards, and I couldn't read it. And I said, what does it say? And she said, that's good. I said, it's good. <laughs> I said, I, that's why I was extending the interpretation. We'll take it. Uh, we did have a Canal Plus, which is the HBO of Europe, did a documentary on us. And it has now been, every time they show it, about every six months, and when they show it, we get a slew of calls from Europe and from Australia and uh, from New Zealand, because they're all tied together. Now this is, this is my mother's favorite book. This is the first book. This was really, Todd, uh, Todd's got a big role in this book. It was our first three or four years of the digital conversion. Governor Wise and Governor Bush wrote the forward, and Senator Warner from Virginia uh, did the back cover. And I'm real pleased. Pearson was a publisher for this. I don't know. I don't know why, but it started selling like crazy. I was three years old, and all of a sudden it's going. I they, they said we're not doing any marketing at all with it. My point is, it's because people are catching up with the idea of digital conversion. And this book was ahead of its time, and now it's uh, starting to catch up. So good. Now we had the president come to this uh, a couple of years ago, and. I'll tell you, it's, I don't care what your political persuasion is, uh, having the president come to visit, and we've never had a president to visit Morrisville. They claim that a president drove by in a train at one time. <laughs> so nobody could see, but they, they thought the president came and it was a incredibly exciting time for us. He also uh, used that to announce the new E-rate configuration, which by the way, in Morrisville, we're, it's, I'm trying to think, right at a million dollars benefit. I was up at the White House meeting when uh, they were debating the E-rate configuration with the FCC, and they didn't tell me then they were going to come to Morrisville, but a couple weeks later, we got that call that was really neat to hear the president say this.
I think that the leaders that have influenced me in my career, a couple things that were uh, similarities. One, willing to give to others, you know, willing to share and help other people grow. Uh, another is uh, people that are gracious. Chuck Fowler, uh, who was, when I was a principal in Sarasota, Florida, was my superintendent. And he's a mentor, and we're still close. He was both left from there. He was a BOCE superintendent up in New York, and, and we both served. I served as past president of Horse Man League, and he was president this past year. But he was one of the most gracious people. Now, he was a strong leader. Uh, I wouldn't actually call him a tough leader, but he was a strong leader. But he was so gracious. And I really do believe that, particularly when you see the victory all the dialogue in politics today, it, 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 I'm worried sick about it. it. It makes me ill when I see people running for office that are pitting people against each other. Mm -hmm. uh, but I really do believe that as superintendents, it is so important to have a gracious disposition. And you know, one of the things that, whether it's a talking to a custodian, whether it's talking to somebody on the street or whoever, I think that uh, just understanding that whoever that is you're working for and having that way. Now, Jack and I can recall a superintendent early in his career, first year, who got just so full of being important that by the second year he was full of being important somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Just didn't understand, you know, you're you're a superintendent, that's that's a good deal. It's important. But having that gracious disposition and you know, when we all lift, we're all lifted, encouraging, constant encouragement. You know, when we don't have salary increases, you know, our teacher of the year this year, Alan Stevens, this breaks my heart. April first he resigned, seventeen years in it. One of the finest teachers I've ever known in my career. A guy who is all in, gives, gives. and doesn't want to be an administrator, just all about teaching. And a phenomenal, taught my son, just a great guy. But he said, I have to give up teaching because I can't, I either give up teaching or I give up my home. And I've got three children and I've got two going to college and I can't afford to be a teacher in this state anymore. And it's heartbreaking. I, I use that in a newspaper article, so it's heartbreaking. And then I immediately had an attack on me saying that I was politicizing a teacher's resignation. And all of us, I said, I was heartbroken that we're seeing that. We're going to continue to see that. By the way, when you try to hire your biggest challenge, I don't care where you, what district you're, you're one of your biggest challenges will be staffing, finding teachers, and finding leaders. Mm -hmm. By the way, the pipeline from out of state, Ed, is dried up. At, people aren't going to come here. They're going to say, Are you kidding? I mean, I was trying to recruit a guy from Guilford the other day. He said, Yeah, I looked into it. Man, what happened? That's what everybody says. What happened in North Carolina? But mentoring, I would hope you would do this with two or three of your principals or four or five of your principals or some of your staffs and office staff actively embrace the role as a mentor. I can tell you right now, Todd and I, when he was a principal, I talked to Todd on a regular basis. I would say, now, Todd, when you're a superintendent, sometimes it would be when we were dealing with some tough stuff, I said, now, when you're a superintendent, currently with Dr. Mooney, uh, Dr. Black, Dr. Gardner, Dr. Royal, when I'm talking to any of them, you know what I say? Now, when you're a superintendent, I, and I think it's important when you put that in, somebody said that to me one time. They said, Mark, when you're a superintendent, and I said, what are you talking about? said, no, I'm talking to you. But I think when you do that, when you inculcate that, people start thinking about their role as a bigger role. I think the most powerful force we have in any classroom in North Carolina today is love. I, I really believe, I think when you create a loving, caring environment, everything goes better. I think children are more readily learn. Teachers do better, and, and I guarantee you, how many of you been in a class before where you could, sit, could you could sense the tension between the teacher and the students? Have you ever been there? I was in one yesterday. And by the way, that means I tell you, there's typically there's there's lots of issues. One is an absence; they don't love each other. And I will tell you, how many of you have had a parent say to you, "My child loves this teacher." Mm -hmm. We've all heard it. You know what? Having a loving, caring environment, I think that it is a foundational to everything we do in school. And as, as a superintendent, if you are afraid to talk about love and relationships and care, I don't think you can be effective. I, I, to this, we talk about love just about every single principal's meeting that we have. And we have that. We talk about creating a loving environment. And you know, we were talking today, we had an issue with a student probably going to result in a long-term suspension. We could go back to said this this young person we have to look at the context that they're coming from the things they don't have in their lives so creating a loving caring environment and then i think we have to also do this we have to realize that every day is precious we should take 
full advantage of it and resonate in that day. Uh, a few years ago, my son's 15 now, but when he was around seven or eight, we were going to Carowind. So we were walking in, it was a Saturday morning, it was kind of big blue skies, and it was actually, summer was kind of cool, so it was unusual. We were walking, I said, hey, Luke, grab my hand, and we're going in. And uh, we were walking, all of a sudden he just stops. And I said, Luke, what's on? He goes, Dad, today might just be the best day ever. <laughs> now, it was a great day for him because we rode, we rode some roller coaster about five times. I was ill. But I really do believe this. Think about this for so many of your students today, tomorrow. It might be their best day ever. It could be their best day ever. And I think that for a teacher, and this is the best day I've ever had as a teacher. Now, I've had teachers say, this is the best day of my career. Or a principal say, you know, I've never, you know, and, and sometimes we, we stop, we don't reflect enough to say, wow, this is, this is pretty exciting. This is good. And I think we need to pause and reflect and understand that today's the day. Uh, now, I love our motto, every child, every day. And, you know, you heard Todd reference this too, and I talked about moving from a teacher-centered or adult-centered environment to a student-centered. I think you have to constantly fight those forces. I think because you now our teachers are battered and bruised, so they're kind of they're they're fighting. Uh, and I will tell you, being a teacher in North Carolina today, I mean, when you think about it. By the way, when you're 50, get out of here. Uh, you know, we don't care what you've done. And, you know, and when you hear this diatribe, oh, we gave last year the teachers in North Carolina got a raise. Oh, I say, you know, guy attacked me for. I said, no, no, no. About 18 percent got a raise. About 80% did not get a raise. They got a one-time bonus after a 1-2% raise in nine years. That's no, You don't treat your enemies that way. You, know, you have to create an environment where you say to people, we care about you. And I hope that we'll have some, like, I have a meeting uh, Friday with Craig Horn uh, and some legislative members trying to create, these are House members trying to set some stage for some positive things. But conversations and nomenclature matters a lot. As a superintendent, if you talk about student achievement, people are going to be talking about student achievement. If you talk, if, if we're standing up and we're whining and complaining, people are going to whine and complain. If you're talking about love, people are going to talk about love. If you're talking about all the bad parents we have, they're going to be talking. So what you say, the nomenclature that you effectuate in the culture is unbelievably powerful. And I love this. Now, one of the great teachers that I worked with more was Scott Brew. By the way, Todd turned in his papers. Been broken heart about that. A guy that's he goes, I'd like to work four or five hundred years, but there's no motivation whatsoever to keep working. I can go. He goes, I can be Walmart greener and do better. This guy is a biology champion. Over the last nine years, his average uh, performance is right around ninety-five percent passing. And when we hit. Our graduation rate when we went, I can't remember if Todd we were over 90 or where we were, but a big milestone. And we were kind of having one of these reflective, let's celebrate. Wow, look what we went from here to here. We're on our way. We've got the momentum. And uh, Scott went up and said, wait just a second. Let's put the party hats up. 10% of our students aren't there yet. So before we had a big celebration, let's stay focused on every child every day. And that was a teacher leader, but that was a leader for everybody, making those making that big, big thing. And I, and I have to tell you, my son just had him. And I tell you, I just, I think that we've got, on all of your districts, we have so many great teachers that are feeling battered and bruised. And I tell you, they need, you talk about love, they need a lot of love, a lot of care, and a lot of nurturance. There's my, my friend, uh, Terry Greer, just retired from Houston. Talked to him on the way up here today. He'll be in Rowan County tomorrow. We're going over to see uh, Lynn Moody there have a big celebration in Roy County tomorrow. But daily leadership, you know, it's interesting, having been a dean, we have all the debate on SAT and ACT, and I was at a national dean's conference and they were doing the, the, the definitive research around colleges of education. What influences student success in college? It wasn't SAT or ACT. It wasn't IQ. It wasn't all, you know what it was? Attendance and daily work. Those are attendants. If you show up, you, first of all, you've got to show up to be there. You have to go to succeed. And then daily work. Now, by the way, I think the corollary is spot on for principals and superintendents. The daily work matters. Number one, 
using information. By the way, when we talk about forwards of data analysis, I used to think it's just numbers. It's not numbers, it's logistics, it's resources. You know, one of the things that I love, we have developed a maturity around using data that now our teachers, when they're having a data meeting and they'll say, well, we have a teacher and we'll talk and we'll put up numbers and say, well, these teachers, you know, these teachers are all at 80, these teachers at 60. They'll say, well, here's the problem. She got three students in in the last six weeks from different places. And I said, well, then what, what are you thinking? They said, we need to leverage some more resources to support her, so we're going to do this. I'm going to go ahead and model. So that's using formative data analysis to drive resources where they're needed. And it also takes some of the fear out of looking at information. And by the way, if teachers are saying, I don't want to look at that information, it's probably not for a good reason. Now, one, it takes maturity. It took, it, it's taken us years. But by the way, every principal in Houston has sat through a data meeting in Mooresville. Every principal in CMS has sat through a data meeting in Mooresville. And we have people coming in. Now we have visits where people come to visit. Now we have people saying, Can we, we'll fly in people from New York to sit in a two hour meeting. Now, but I tell you what I think they want it. They want to grasp but how do you attach resources to achievement, to really leveraging up uh, student success for everybody. So. That formative data analysis, professional development. I can't say that, you know, invest, invest, invest. It's the lifeblood of learning, mentoring, collaborating. Now, one of the things, we use 50 different content providers. We're constantly, we're having a big debate this morning around math content. And so we're constantly evaluating content, and we use teachers to evaluate. Uh, I seldom ever make a decision about that. I might have a voice, but those decisions are made by teams. So we're constantly looking at the content arrangement, how we're using it. Focusing on grade level department chairs, we do a quarterly session just for teacher leaders. We've done it for years now. Uh, what's been brought out? Lots of teacher leaders that are impacting things in every school. Uh, you know, we've had last year, the dissertation of the year from Harvard was a three year research study on Morrisville Grade District. The definitive finding, and these are, you can look at some of the big names of, from the uh, study. They said the definitive study was is that a culture of leaders can drive almost anything. You have a culture of leaders. So that's been a big key to us. And then we also tie into coaches and performing band directors and choral directors and arts and clubs. And then ultimately, the spontaneous need. You know, that, that's another part of being a superintendent. Usually those are not fun situations. You'll get a call of some crisis that you're going to have to deal with. They have to grow the garden. I'm real pleased that all of our principals of one have their doctoral degree in Morrisville. All of our central office staff has their doctoral degrees. We started working and pushing on it. And I, I really, I was, when I was up in, in Rico County, we set up a graduate doctoral cohort with Virginia Commonwealth University. And whether it's Bill Hyde in Philadelphia or Dallas Dance in uh, Baltimore or Aaron uh, Spence, who used to be here over in uh, Virginia Beach, they were all pushed into a doctoral program, got through. And, did well and a lot of encouragement. Todd didn't need a lot of nurturance, but if you talk to Steve Mooney, another guy who's going to be a great superintendent, I take pride saying I had to throw him across the finish line because he tried to quit two times. I said, No, you're not quitting. I said, You get back in there. You're not going to quit. You had a good reason to adopt with two kids. I said, I don't have those excuses. Those are the two reasons to get your doctoral degree. Mm -hmm. But we have Leadership Academy, a summer institute. We do an early release day for PD. Patrick, do you do those early release days in Green County? Year. And by the way, Patrick, again, uh, this evening, by the way, now, I want to give you a warning. Hmm. Patrick's the bartender. Get there early. Because Patrick, Patrick, now, Patrick knows how to have fun. That's important. <laughs> <laughs> That's important. A lot of visitors. By the way, you got to pull weeds. Now, this is something. Yes. How many of you guys have ever worked a garden? Mm -hmm. If you've worked a garden, then you know you've got to pull weeds. And by the way, the garden of your faculties, if you're not willing to pull weeds, the weeds will choke out the fruit and the vegetables. You gotta do it. You gotta drive hard with a soft touch. I love this term and I'm real pleased that Michael Floyd likes this term so much he said, I want a chapter on this book called Directional Nurturance. And by, by the way, I think this is the way one of the real keys to being a good leader, being a good superintendent. Offer of firm direction with a lot of nurturance. Firm direction, a lot of nurturance, and talk about that morale, celebrate the work, organizational discipline. Mentioned the visitors we've had and we've brought in. I, I do want to show this jacket. I know I'm getting ready to close it out, but I want to show this real quick. 
Again, we would not have people interested in Mooresville if we didn't have associative achievement. So last year, in terms of annual measure objectives, we were third in the state. The year before that, we were number one in the state. We had 100 goals. Uh, then when you look at, uh, in terms of achievement, top 10 districts in the state, and this is in terms of the EOCs and EOGs, we were uh, third, and on a big, big chapter, Union County, there's such great work. We've seen a huge increase in scholarships, uh, career and technical education. Uh, last year, 20, 20 state champions were awards, 20 students going to the national competition. By the way, we took first and second place in robotics, didn't even have a team four years ago. I just talked to our advisor and I said, and I said, you know, last year they came into the state competition with two teams with their white t-shirts with the blue M spray painted. So let them take jump teams. They said, who's going for third? We got two teams. They took first and second in the state. We got four teams this year. Mm -hmm. The guy said, we're going to go for first and second. Mm -hmm. We're not going to do that. But mm -hmm. hey, bye -bye. Oh, there we go. That's my wife's favorite book. Consistency. <clears throat> People underestimate value of consistency. That just means keeping the keeping the pump fires burning down. I want to I want to give a big shout out to uh, Todd. I invited Todd this week to be part of AA Digital Consortium. He turned it down. Smart superintendent. You know what he said? I'm staying home. I'm staying close to the home fire. I'm not gonna be running around. Now there's another superintendent friend of mine who I called up and I said, you're gonna get your butt fired if you don't stay home. Quit running around and trying to be a celebrity when you're just learning to be a superintendent. Mm -hmm. and I really believe this. I think it's important to keep those home fires burning. And now I travel a lot, but when you have to get 20 some years in, and what well, you, can, you can do that if you if you feel comfortable that you can write your ticket tomorrow, you'll do it. Gotta stay close to home. And I would say this as a superintendent. Make sure that you can tell people what you're learning and how you're growing. And ultimately, uh, the bottom line is that it's just imperative that we stay focused on the main thing, and that is that you know, we're all here for students and just focus. And I will tell you, I would encourage this. If you constantly are talking about students, your nomenclature, we're always talking about students, you're going to have an impact on students. If you're talking about adult stuff and other things, uh, but I, again, I want to congratulate you, and I want to thank you in advance for what you're doing. Your, your role is important. I know that, Ed, you're going to get some great information. You have to work closely with your school board. We've been blessed, and more as what Todd mentioned, to have strong, supportive school board members. Uh, but ultimately, it comes down to your leadership will impact children and will impact communities and impact families and adults, and it's more important than ever before. So I want to thank you. Jack, thank you very much. May the force be with you.